All right, I want to once again welcome everybody who's joining us today. This is our Friday Healthy Conversation Series. We're here every Friday uh, at noon with a different health and wellness expert telling you how you can live healthier, live better. We're doing this every week leading up to World Diabetes Day on November 14th. And with me today is Lisa Williams. She's a diabetes educator at the South Coast Health Diabetes Management Program. She's going to talk to us today. Her presentation is entitled Nourishing Nutrients for People with Diabetes. If at any point during our presentation today you have a question you'd like to ask, you can uh, click the Q&A button. If you're with us on Zoom, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, uh, type in your question, or use the chat function to type in your question, and we will uh, do our best to answer it throughout the program. With that, I will turn it over to Lisa for the information you came to hear today. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yes, okay, very good. Thank you for coming today. Uh, today's topic is nourishing nutrients for people with diabetes. And some of the topics we're gonna cover today is the uh, brief overview of the My Plate Planner, understanding carbohydrates, fiber basics, all about protein, heart healthy fats, eating less salt, uh, the nutrition facts label, eating healthy on a budget, uh, stocking your pantry for COVID-19. And I also have some um, resources. And I think I also threw in a slide somewhere on some um, smart snacks, which is something people ask about often. So with that, we will get started. Um, I always like to start a, a presentation. Um, we tend to bounce off of this uh, My Plate Planner frequently. It's a nice representation of um, all the components of a healthy meal. We might not have every single one of these components at a given meal, but they are important to include um, in meals throughout the day. Today we're going to focus more on the macronutrients and the macronutrients are the foods that your body needs in larger quantities. And these are the carbohydrates, the proteins and the fat, as opposed to our micronutrients, which are things like vitamins and minerals that are very important to the body, but your body just needs those in smaller amounts. We often use the exchange lists for meal planning to categorize foods. So these um, lists um, separate foods out into groups and uh, portion sizes. So the starches, the fruits, the milks, the non-starchy vegetables, um, meats, and the fats. It's um, a sort of a nice general guideline for people to follow. And then this further breaks it down. In the diabetes world, a serving of a carbohydrate is roughly 15 grams of carbohydrate. So for example, a piece of bread, a small piece of fruit is 15 grams of carbohydrate, and a glass of milk or um, a dairy product is a little bit less, about 12. But then it also has general information on how much protein, fat, and then calories are included. So again, it's a, it's a nice way to roughly calculate uh, how many calories you may have had in a day or how many grams of carbohydrate have been in your meal plan. So uh, the different types of carbohydrates are the starches, which are also known as complex carbohydrates, the sugars and fiber. The starches include starchy vegetables, such as corn, peas, lima beans, and potatoes, as well as dried beans, lentils, peas, uh, different types of beans, kidney beans, pinto beans, black-eyed peas, and split peas, and then grains, such as oats, barley, and rye. We often hear um, recommendations to consume whole grain breads uh, versus uh, refined grains. So just to go over that and to provide you with a little bit of a better understanding, a whole grain, a grain contains three parts. It contains the bran, which is the outer hard shell of the grain. 
And this contains the most fiber, most of the B vitamins and minerals. The next layer is the germ. And this contains many nutrients, including essential fatty acids and vitamin E. And then in the center of the grain is the endosperm. And this is where all the starch is. If you consume a whole grain, it contains the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. So you get all the nutrients. When you have a refined grain, such as white bread, um, you, you have, you only getting the starchy part. So they strip the grain apart and they leave it with the, the, the endosperm, the starchy part. So you're missing out on many of the vitamins and minerals. So that's why when we encourage you to purchase whole grain bread, whole grain crackers, we really want to look for that um, term whole grain. Now the sugars, there's two types of sugars. There's natural sugar, such as those found in fruit and milk. And then we have the added sugars. And those are sugars that are added in processing, such as sugar that they would um, add to make a cookie. Now, and we're gonna talk about the nutrition label a little bit more, but the food label identifies now the add, both the added sugar and the natural sugars in food. So it's nice to, way to determine how much added sugar is in a product. Now the fibers are derived from plant foods. It's the indigestible part of, of plant foods. And adults typically need about 25 to 30 grams of fiber each day. Good sources of fiber are beans and legumes, fruits, vegetables, and then whole grain pasta, cereals, breads, nuts. So we really, um, even though we have a guideline for the amount of fiber to have, really a good idea is to try to focus on increasing your consumption of a variety of fruits, vegetables, increasing um, beans and legumes in your meal plan, and then again, using the whole grain breads and pastas. Now, this is just sort of a list that um, shows some portion sizes of foods. And again, in the diabetes world, a serving size is considered about 15 grams of carbohydrate. We often provide patients with lists similar to this just to show them how much um, carbohydrates or what would be a serving. The best source of information is a label, but this is just a nice little, a, a nice little guideline. I always explain to patients that just because foods are listed on here doesn't necessarily mean we're encouraging them them to eat them, um, you know, and there are, I do like to point out some of the healthier choices. For example, a third of a cup, cup of um, brown or white rice, naturally we would encourage more brown rice or wild rice or quinoa. If we were encouraging, if someone were to have like an English muffin, we would encourage whole grain. Um, we typically um, would encourage maybe more of a sweet potato instead of a mashed potato. So we really wanna focus on um, healthy choices. When we count carbohydrates, we don't always just look at the quantity of carbohydrates, but we also really try to focus hard on the quality of the food. So we wanna try to choose good quality carbohydrates. And again, these are just some serving sizes of fruits. Typically, it's a small piece of fruit. If, um, for example, if someone saw a piece of fruit such as an orange that was very large, the size of a grapefruit, we would say maybe just have half or uh, maybe try to buy some smaller like the tangerines or the cutie, cuties. Um, so we encourage people to eat fruits. We just um, want people to eat small amounts and to spread it out throughout the day. And then of course the dairy, which is about a serving is about 12 grams of carbohydrate. And we want to encourage low fat dairy. Greek yogurt is a good choice. Um, again, low fat milk. Many people um, I find are choosing almond milk because it's much lower in carbohydrates. Um, vegetables do have a small amount of carbohydrate, but people typically don't eat enough of them. So we really don't, I certainly don't. Um, um, I encourage people to eat as, as much as they want. Sometimes with foods like corn and peas, maybe um, a little um, to be mindful of those, but otherwise we really want people to eat vegetables. Lots of them um, try to get a variety is important. That way you get all the different vitamins, minerals, and fiber mixes. 
Now, some foods that don't contain carbohydrate but are included in the plate are meat, seafood, poultry, eggs, cheese, um, fats, oils, and nuts. So those, if we went back to the plate, that would be that little quarter part of the plate for a lot of these things that are the um, proteins. Now, again, a little bit more about fiber. Fiber is found in plant foods, such as fruits, vegetables, beans, and whole grains. Um, increasing the fiber in your diet lowers your risk for heart disease and cancer. It helps with other health, health conditions, such as diabetes, weight management, and digestive issues. There's two different types of fiber. We have our soluble fiber, which is our viscous fiber, as well as the insoluble fiber. Now the soluble fiber is the fiber that's helpful in lowering cholesterol or your LDL cholesterol. I like to refer to it as your L for lousy cholesterol. Some people call it the bad cholesterol. So what happens is, is when you choose a food that has a lot of soluble fiber, for example, say oatmeal, what it does is it grabs onto the cholesterol, it forms a gel, grabs onto that cholesterol and um, binds with the cholesterol and removes the cholesterol from your body. It also slows the digestion of carbohydrates, which helps to control glucose levels. So for example, when you have a food that's high in fiber, rather than have a quick spike in blood sugar, it kind of slows down the digestion. So you have a more, keeps your blood sugar more stable. Now the insoluble fiber, this is what sometimes you hear referred to as um, like the chimney sweep, what this does is it um, helps keep your bowels running smoothly and prevents constipation. So insoluble fiber is a very important part of your diet. So um, both insoluble and soluble fiber are important. And oftentimes they are found in, um, might be found in the same food. For example, you might take a pear. A pear might have say roughly four grams of total fiber. Two might be soluble, two might be insoluble. So again, it's really important to get a variety of foods in your meal plan because you do get the different mixes of uh, fiber, which is important. Now, some tips for adding fiber to your meal plan is you always want to add the fiber to your diet slowly. So if you're not used to having a high fiber diet, you might just want to gradually increase each day, add um, a, a serving of a high fiber food. You want to drink plenty of fluids to keep your digestive tract running smoothly. So it's kind of like a clogged pipe. If you have a lot of fiber, but not the water to help move things through, it could result in some uh, constipation. So again, you want to add it slowly and make sure you have enough fluids in your meal plan. Again, choosing whole grain breads, crackers, and cereals. <clears throat> you can add wheat germ or wheat bran, oat bran, rice bran to certain foods. Adding beans, peas, and lentils to soups, stews, and salad. Now's a great time of year to make um, different types of soups or stews, um, easy to do in a crock pot. So it's always good. I will often add, even if the recipe doesn't call for it, if it's more like a vegetable type uh, soup or something, I might um, always add some, some beans to it. Just again, it gives a little more bulk and um, it's a good way to add the fiber. Adding almonds to a salad is um, a another way to increase the fiber and also mixing flaxseed into muffins and to oatmeal. That's um, an easy thing to do. And you can find the ground flaxseed. Usually where I see it, if you're looking for it in a grocery store such as Stop and Shop, they usually have, um, I find it in the little healthy food section is usually where you find the ground flaxseed in the grocery store. It might be other spots, but that's where I find it. Uh, more tips for adding fiber to your meal plan include one to three servings of fruits and vegetables at each meal. Now, I like to think about this is um, there used to be a campaign years ago and they called it the five a day campaign and they wanted everyone to consume five servings a day of fruits and vegetables. Well, now they've increased it to seven to nine servings a day. So for some people that I see, they haven't quite reached the five a day mark. So I've gone back to that five a day campaign. I try to encourage people to look back on your meal sometimes at the end of the day and think, did I consume? have five servings a day of fruits and vegetables at least, or maybe more, which is of course even better. 
a serving of a fruit and vegetable is very small. So for example, a serving of a vegetable is only about a half a cup, which is really not much at all. So if you had say a whole cup of vegetables with a meal, that would be two servings right there. And then if you had a small piece of fruit, say at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there would be five or including say some uh, cut up vegetables for a snack was another way to sort of work things in. So it really is a good idea to kind of think back from time to time and think if you have met that goal. Um, it's great to steam sometimes probably more vegetables than fruit. So they remain colorful and crunchy and it helps uh, preserve some of the nutrients in the food. Um, good uh, to try brown rice, um, even wild rice or quinoa or other options to try to, to try. Those are, a, again, a great source of fiber. And again, choose vegetables packed with soluble fiber, such as Brussels sprouts, acorn squash, lima beans, broccoli, cabbage, green beans, onions, parsnips. Um, turnips, carrots, okra, and eggplant. So um, you can get, if you're interested in learning, you could probably, um, there's, um, we'll go over some resources at the um, end of the presentation where you can find information on this, or if you meet with a registered dietitian, they could also provide you uh, with this information. And again, just back, um, back on ways to increase some of the vegetables in your meal plan is now, again, is also a great time of year to roast mm -hmm. vegetables. So it's, um, and they taste even better the next day. So sometimes if you just roast a whole pan of vegetables, it's nice to um, be able to have them for leftovers. Lisa, I, I wonder if I could jump in. Sure. With a question real quick. We have one question from uh, a member of the audience asking about uh, canned or frozen vegetables versus fresh vegetables. Are they just as good, not as good? Yeah, I think fresh, of course, especially in season is the best. Frozen would be probably, I find that even myself more towards when we get past, say, December, when there's less fresh local things available, I'm buying more uh, frozen vegetables, which are really great. And um, one nice thing about frozen vegetables is um, once the vegetables are picked, they're sort of processed right away as opposed to certain vegetables that might, especially if they're traveling a long distance, they might lose, slowly lose some of their nutritional value. And especially during these, these uh, COVID times, during the pandemic, there's a lot of people touching them. So if you think about frozen vegetables, they're really great because they're processed right away. So the nutrients are sealed and then there's uh, fewer, um, less handling of it, which is really good. The canned vegetables are probably my least favorite they uh, contain uh, more salt. Um, you can get lower sodium versions, but they kind of sit in water. So it's really um, probably, I mean, it is good. And we're gonna talk about the canned and keeping things on hand, especially during uh, times of the pandemic. But I would think that fresh, especially in season is the best. And then um, probably, yeah, frozen, of course it's great. It's great to keep them on hand. They've made them very easy. Um, to prepare. So it really is a good idea to always have some frozen. That's great. And I, I'll, I'll just say that I was really happy to hear that a serving is half a cup. That's because I definitely struggle to get five servings a day. So I felt a lot better knowing that oh, I'm right. probably getting, I'm probably getting multiple servings in this one meal. Right. Well, that's a good thing. For sure. Uh, so the, uh, Requirements for fi for fiber vary, again, for uh, women, men, and based on age. But again, we don't really want you to spend your day counting up every gram of, of um, fiber that you include. But again, just thinking back to how many servings you had of, again, the fruits, vegetables, and whole grains is a much easier way to do it. And I would guarantee if you're choosing whole grain um, breads or crackers and eating at minimum of five, if not more servings of fruits and vegetables, you're going to meet this goal. So don't get too bogged down with the numbers. Okay, now we're gonna move on to talk about some protein. So protein is a nutrient that's needed for cells to grow and repair as well as build strong muscles. 
Protein needs vary based on different factors such as age, gender, health status, activity level. Um, for example, someone might need more protein um, during pregnancy, lactation. Um, children need more protein than adults. Um, somebody might need more protein when they're healing from surgery or after an illness. Um, most Americans get more than enough protein. Um, so protein really for most is an, um, an issue. And what your body, if you have too much protein, your body will um, excrete what, what it doesn't need at that time. So really um, overdoing with the protein is it isn't really necessary. Now protein can come from both animal and plant foods. Some sources of protein are better choices. Many protein rich uh, foods are also high in saturated fat, which increases risk for heart disease. Um, so foods that are high in saturated fat, which we encourage patients to limit or avoid are things such as bacon, sausage, fried chicken, hot dogs, lunch meats, organ meats, processed foods, spare ribs, um, breaded and fried fish or shellfish and um, whole milk or other full fat dairy products. The proteins that are heart healthy that we want people to consume more of that may help improve blood pressure and cholesterol. And those are foods such as lean cuts of beef, pork loin, skinless chicken and turkey, uh, fish, low fat dairy, um, yogurt, milk, cheese, cottage cheese, legumes, nuts and seeds, and um, eggs, of course, which I don't know why is it on this list, um, but eggs are equally um, a great source of protein, very economical. economical. Uh, so we want people to choose healthy sources of protein. And again, similar to what it said on the last slide, sometimes people often ask about eggs, they'll often ask about uh, shellfish like shrimp, um, but it's not the cholesterol in the food that raises blood cholesterol. They found it's the saturated fat that raises uh, blood cholesterol. So sometimes even though a food like an egg has cholesterol, it's really oftentimes what we do to it. So for example, if you had shrimp with a little fresh lemon or maybe a little bit of cocktail sauce, it's different to have just that versus like baked stuffed shrimp, which is oozing with goo and, and butter and bits and pieces. So we really want to focus not only on um, the type of food, but how we prepare it. And again, really, we don't need a lot of protein in your diet. And again, it varies based on um, age and um, some of the things we talked about before. But for the most people having like three ounces with lunch and dinner, maybe one ounce at breakfast is um, adequate. And these are just some examples of um, lean sources of protein. Now, heart healthy fats, unsaturated fats are considered the healthy fats and have shown to have some positive health benefits. The difference in um, unsaturated fats versus saturated fats is saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Think about butter, lard, whereas unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperatures. Now the unsaturated fat come in two forms, the polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. And they're just a little different in the chemical structure and they provide some different health benefits. The polyunsaturated fats, um, these are essential in the diet because they can't be made by the body. And these are, I'm sure you've all heard about the omega-3 fatty acids. And these help prevent heart disease in many ways. They uh, help prevent no promote normal functions of the brain and nervous system. They help to lower cholesterol and triglyceride levels, um, protect against dry eye disease, and they can reduce some inflammation in the body. And there's different types of omega-3s. I'm sure you've heard about, um, we, we usually you just use the, the first three initials because they're kind of a, a mouthful to say, but we have the ALA, the DHA, the EPA. For example, salmon tends to be very high in the DHA and EPA um, omega-3s. 
And some sources of omega-3 fatty acids that are great to include in your meal plan are things such as fatty fish. Um, it's recommended to try to have twice per week, such as salmon, herring, sardines, um, and some other types of fish. Uh, walnuts, um, flaxseed. Uh, we spoke briefly about flaxseed earlier. And um, be sure to select the ground flaxseed as your body is unable to break down the whole flaxseed to access the omega-3 oils. So again, you can find that ground flaxseed in the uh, little health food section at, at uh, your grocery store. Um, also chia seeds, hemp seeds, and eggs. Some um, eggs, it's good if you might note on the package, um, some chickens are fed grain that is a little bit higher in omega-3s. Now the monounsaturated fat, these fats help to increase the HDL, which is the good, or like I like to say, the happy cholesterol in your body. And some sources of monounsaturated fats include nuts, olive oil, canola oil, avocado, peanut butter. If you're buying peanut butter, it's good to get the natural version. Um, sometimes what they do in processing is they take a perfectly good product like a peanut, but when they go to make it into peanut, butter, they might add some unhealthy fats and some sugar. So the ones that say natural are um, just better choices because they're just adding less things, um, unhealthy things in processing. So there's like the Teddy, there's the, um, you know, even Skippy makes a natural version. Some of them do have a, um, some oil on the top. That's actually a very healthy oil. So don't drain it off. Just try to mix it back in again. So you're getting the benefits from that fat. Some of these proteins and healthy fats, such as the peanut butter, the avocado, those are great things to include. Sometimes breakfast can be tough for people with diabetes. We typically don't recommend cold cereals. They um, tend to result in high blood sugars. Um, oatmeal is just about the only cereal I will recommend for most people. Um, but so sometimes avocado or peanut butter on a piece of whole grain um, toast or um, half a whole grain English muffin is a good way to um, get that balance of um, include some healthy fats in, in, in that particular meal. And here's just a picture again of just some um, different types of healthy fats. Now eating less salt, sodium is an essential mineral. It helps control um, muscle and nerve function. However, too much salt can result in high blood pressure. Table salt is a combination of two minerals, sodium and chloride. Now, the, uh, in the 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines, the re recommendation is for um, most people to consume less than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. And for some people, even the recommendation is even lower, 1,500 milligrams per day. So just to give you an example of what that looks like, a teaspoon of salt is about 2,300 um, milligrams of sodium. Some foods naturally contain salt and others have added salt. So foods that contain the most salt are things like canned soups, again, canned vegetables, frozen dinners, condiments, snack foods, um, chips, crackers, pretzels, processed meats, again, the bacon, sausage, lunch meats, hot dogs, um, and some mixed dishes. So where you find the most salt is in those processed, packaged, and prepared foods. If you're going to the grocery store and buying mostly fresh frozen vegetables, um, fruit, chicken, fish, more natural foods, then um, you will avoid that added salt. Um, again, if you do um, keep things on hand, which is perfectly fine, everybody has uh, cans of soup and different things, on their shelf, just try to get a lower sodium version. At least it might still be a little bit higher in salt even than what might be recommended, but it's at least it's a better choice. So do try to just be mindful of the amount of salt. And another thing to think about with that is with the condiments is that we really try to minimize them. If you've ever bought a new refrigerator or moved like I did once and you take everything off the door of your fridge and put it on a counter, it is amazing how much it, it adds up, you know, mustard, relish, ketchups, things like salad dressings. So if you think about it, we really want to minimize those. We want to try to use less, trying to go to use more, say, olive oil and vinegar on salads. 
um, trying to have less condiments because even though they're enjoyable to add to food, they really offer pretty much no nutritional value. So we really want to try to use them in very small portions and try to have less of them on our taking up space in our fridge. So again, choosing more fresh fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy, um, choose when you're buying um, canned, most frozen veggies don't have any salt unless they come with a sauce, which we recommend just getting the plain frozen veggies, but try to choose versions of uh, no added salt or low sodium. Use herbs and sodium free seasonings. There's plenty on the market today and there's a lot of really nice ones. I particularly like the lemon pepper one, but Mrs. Dash has a whole line um, and there's some other spice companies that, um, you know, even in the supermarket that have lower sodium seasonings available. And then again, there are some condiments that you can get um, that are, are will indicate lower salt <clears throat> and even some that one might indicate lower sugar too, if you're looking for that. Uh, when dining out, um, it is good if you're able to locate for many of the chain style restaurants, they have information online and there's certain apps that have information, um, uh, nutrition information on their website that you can look so you can get an idea. It's sometimes shocking if you ever have time. It's in interesting to look up some chain style restaurants and, and note the sodium content of some of the food. And uh, so it's a good idea to try to order more plain foods, try to minimize things with a lot of sauces and gravies, maybe ask for your salad dressing on the side, try to have um, smaller portions take half home because most times when you do eat out, the foods contain a lot more salt and a lot more um, fats and unfortunately health, unhealthy fats than you might have at home. And they also tend to fill the plate up in many places with a lot of starchy food because it's less expensive. So we just wanna be mindful of that. And um, don't be afraid to ask to swap things out. For example, you know, I like spinach. So even if spinach doesn't come with my meal, the meal I'm looking at, if I see it somewhere else on the menu, I might say, well, instead of a potato, could I just get a side of spinach? So just don't be afraid to ask. Most, most places, as long as it's on their menu, are more than happy to accommodate. Now, these are just some um, claims, some things you might see on a food label. If it's sodium or salt free, that's great. Less than five milligrams of sodium. Very low sodium would be less than 35 milligrams of sodium. Low sodium, uh, 140 uh, milligrams of sodium or less. Now, these reduced sodium and light sodium, those are at least 25 or 50 percent less sodium than the original version. So, for the most part, I encourage people to actually look at the label and see how many milligrams of salt is in the product. But these are a good, um, you know, it's nice so that if you're trying to glance at different things or you're looking for a low sodium soup, if you see one that says very low sodium or low sodium, it's, um, you know, at least it's a starting point to grab and then look further on the back just to see the how much salt is in the product. Um, so now we're going to talk a little about the uh, Nutrition Facts label. In um, 2016, the FDA announced um, some changes to the Nutrition Facts label. Um, effective January of 2020, the big manufacturers changed their food label. The smaller companies um, have a little more time. They have until 2021 to um, update their label. So some of the changes that they made were they've increased the font size of the serving size and the uh, servings per container. So they made that a little bit larger and they also made more uh, reasonable guidelines for what an actual serving is. They've also increased, if you can see on this label, see how the calories is very tiny over here. They've increased the font size of the calories so it's much easier to see. They have um, removed the calories from fat part from the label because they've determined that it's not so much, it's more the type of fat in a meal plan that's important than how much fat is in a meal plan. So they've, um, so they took that out. The best thing I think that they've done is added those, um, the added sugars. So now 
we can see the total carbohydrate that includes the fiber, the sugars, and now we can see how much added sugars is on it. Now the recommendation for added sugar is um, 25 grams um, per day for men, no, for women and 37 and a half for men. So again, it's not something that you have to spend your day like adding up, but if you notice that something has an awful lot of added sugars, then it's good to obviously stay away from that. We want foods that have minimal added sugars. And again, we really want to focus just again, as we want some, um, and we're going to talk a little more about the, the whole grains and things like that. But when we're looking at the, um, at the fiber, we're, we're, like, like we talked before, the whole wheat bread, sometimes you see bread and it says wheat bread, and then I'll look at the label and it will say like 0.5 or zero, or just something very small. Well, that's, that's not good enough. We want three to four. We want, you know, a fair amount of fiber. So we really want to make sure that we have a number there. So that's um, tricky too. So be sure to look at the fiber. Some other things I look at again is the sodium. If we're aiming for 2,300 milligrams or less per day, if you see a can of soup has, you know, 990, that's quite a lot. That's taken up a lot of your, your sodium. So we really kind of want to glance at some of these, um, some of these th th things on the, on the food label to see what's actually in the product. So a lot of it is a lot of people read the label, but they're not necessarily deciphering it. So we just wanna spend a little time deciphering the label when we're um, looking at products. And a great thing to do is start with things you already have at home. So don't feel like you have to go you know, spend hours in the grocery store, maybe look at some things you have in your um, pantry already and then you might say, oh, this has a lot of salt. Let me look and see when I go to the grocery store if I can find something a little better. So again, when we're looking at the label for people that are counting carbohydrates, we're counting the total carbohydrate. And again, that includes the fiber, the sugars, the added sugars, sometimes we see sugar alcohols. So it's the total grams of carbohydrates that we're looking at for people that are carb counting. And again, just to be mindful too, labels um, can be um, off in either direction by they're allowed roughly 20%. So it might always not be 100% accurate. So now just to shift to tips for eating on a budget, um, sometimes making food, healthy food choices while trying to stick to a budget can be difficult. So a good idea is to try to plan your menu for a week or at least get a rough idea. What I like to do is look at the um, flyer for the grocery store that I go to and, and see what's on sale. So if I see chicken is buy one, get one free, I'm most likely gonna buy chicken that week. You put one in the freezer and then you have one to use that week. There's also sometimes coupons in the flyer. Now, a lot of grocery stores have a um, app that you can download that's linked to your card that you scan on your way out. So sometimes when um, before I go, I'll um, make my list and then go to the app and see if there's a coupon for anything on my list that I can um, download before I leave for the store. And then when I scan my card, I um, automatically get the discount. Try to plan meals with opportunities for leftovers, because let's face it, everybody probably doesn't want to cook a fresh meal from scratch every single night. So for example, again, back to if on a Sunday, if you cook a chicken and roasted vegetables, there you can get probably a couple of meals left over from that. Making a big pot of chili or some kind of soup in a crock pot or on your stove is great. And those are things you can even freeze in smaller containers so that you have those um, available at other times. So when you just don't feel like cooking, you can pull something out. Be sure to write down all the ingredients. Try to find some simple recipes. Cooking does not have to be complicated. We want to keep it simple. So try to find um, some simple recipes that you can um, make and just be sure that you have all the ingredients that you need if you are going to have, um, you know, make something special or something a little bit different. Um, I know everyone's probably heard this. Don't shop on an empty stomach. You're likely to buy things that you might not need. That's, um, I think we've all probably been there and ended up with a few extra things in our basket. Um, you can also try generic brands. Usually they are more affordable and often um, contain the same ingredients. 
Uh, make your own portion control snack. Things that come in little packets are usually much more expensive than if you just um, buy them and make them yourself, um, you know. So if you wanted to, um, you know, if you buy a big bag of, um, say, nuts, you could just put some in some little either snack bags or um, little Tupperware containers. I encourage people to, especially with fruit, because sometimes it's easy to sit down, especially in the summer. I hear a lot like watermelon, things like that. So if you buy something like a melon, I get these little, they're like little one cup um, storage containers. And then I will just um, fill them all up, squirt a little lemon over the top of them. And then I have one to grab to take with me to work every day. So if you kind of prepare foods in advance and make your own portion control, it's much easier than um, when you're hungry, you're probably less likely to stop and chop up some cantaloupe. You're probably gonna grab something that might not be as healthy. Um, so having things ready to go snacks are, um, is a good idea. And it's also a good idea just on that note is how we position things in our fridge. Because I say this all the time, the fruits and veggies are at the bottom of the refrigerator in a drawer. So they're not front and center. So we want to try to move things around in our fridge. So when you open the door, even if that's where you store most of your fruits and veg, if you have some pre-portioned things, they're right in front of you. So they're kind of saying, you know, pick me. So we really want to try to um, have things readily available and try to keep maybe some of the unhealthy stuff in the back or in, in an out of the way cabinet. You know, avoid eating out. Restaurant meals are typically more expensive than it would cost to prepare the meal at home. They typically are higher in, again, the saturated fat, salt, and sugar. And as I said before, try to review the nutrition information beforehand. Um, there's a great app, um, Calorie King, which has information. It's a free app for your phone. They also have the book. Uh, one of my patients also got the large print book, which was nice. And you can look up if there is a place you go, say, if I somebody goes to 99 or someplace you can look up even in advance and see the nutrition information. So you can um, maybe help to make some better choices. Um, again, more fruits and veggies. You can grow a garden. Um, again, purchase seasonal produce. Um, look at the little uh, sales section um, in the grocery store. Usually you can find some really interesting products. I usually find sometimes I get like red um, peppers, different color peppers that are on that little good but not quite good enough section. And those are um, it's a great place to get some um, good deals on produce. And again, the frozen uh, fruits and vegetables, especially um, sometimes for some people, the frozen, a lot of my patients I find get a lot of the frozen berries because they're easy. You can just take out as much as you need if you have it for breakfast the night before and um, put it in the fridge so that way it doesn't go bad. You want to limit the red meat. Um, you want to choose um, lower lower uh, cost and sometimes some healthier choices of proteins, um, such as chicken. Um, try to include fish, unsalted nuts, beans in your meal plan. Beans are usually pretty economical. And again, just for a healthy meal plan, try a vegetarian dish uh, once a week using maybe eggs or beans. Now, just some information um, with the COVID pandemic lingering and um, even not just COVID, but for anything that could happen, whether it's a winter storm or um, things like that, it's always good to have some um, healthy foods available. We wanna remember, we wanna make sure we have enough stocked in our kitchen, but we wanna leave enough for everybody else too. So try not to, you know, we don't certainly don't wanna hoard. Um, it's a good idea to take an inventory of what you already have because sometimes if you're not prepared or if you don't look and see what you have, you're gonna end up with a hundred cans of tuna fish or something that you keep buying because you forget if you already have it. I've done that myself. So we wanna to try to take inventory of what we have. We wanna look at expiration dates, try to use up things that might be approaching expiration dates, um, use the older foods first. Um, 
another good thing to remember is foods that are in the freezer. Just because it's in the freezer doesn't mean it lasts forever. So even frozen foods have a shelf life. I try to get some stickers or something, something to label the date. I do that in my fridge too with things like salsa, because how often do you eat a little bit of something and then think, when did we open that salsa? So I write, I keep a Sharpie right in my kitchen. And if I open up a tomato sauce or salsa or just anything, I just quickly write the date that I opened it. So I can tell right away how long it's been there. So we do want to use up things in our freezer. That's stuff that's kind of lurk in the back that you don't know what's in that foil packet. Try to um, try to go through that stuff and use it up and rotate things around there. And then make a list of um, shelf stable foods to take to the grocery store. This is just a copy of something that's offered. You can get downloaded on the uh, diabetes website, but it is kind of a nice little um, grocery list or a good guideline to, um, uh, for things to keep on hand, um, or you can make your own. And um, if, especially for your standard grocery list, um, if it's things you buy frequently. Um, oh, I just threw this in here because people often ask about snacking. So just some good healthy snacks. Um, people get tired of certain things. So cut up veggies with either guacamole, hummus or cottage cheese, uh, roasted pumpkin seeds, um, the skinny pop, original popcorn, those come in large bags and pre-portioned packets. Um, cocoa um, almonds that are dusted in cocoa. Um, some of my patients have also been talking to me about the salt and vinegar almonds, um, which they seem to be enjoying. Um, some, there's a lot of, there's some various um, health bars that are, that are okay. This is just one, the RX bar for kids is a little bit smaller. The kind bars are a good choice and those also come in the snack size now. And for people in the summertime that are um, desiring like a frozen dessert, those Yasso frozen yogurt bars are pretty good. They're nice and creamy and, you know, are, um, it's easy to stick to a serving size. So again, more on stocking your pantry. Again, trying to get more shelf-stable fruit. Apples tend to last a long time. Those cuties, mandarins, um, Oranges tend to last a while, frozen fruit, uh, keep canned or dried beans on hand, the lower salt canned vegetables, um, some rice, quinoa, um, brown rice, wild rice, things like that are good to always have on hand. Um, not a bad idea to keep pouches or cans of chicken or fish, nuts, seeds, nuts, butters. Um, be sure to have, um, you know, a good supply of olive oil, canola oil, vegetable oil, and of course, some dried herbs and spices. Some resources. So I did see on the Road to Wellness Facebook page that if you scroll over to there's a files tab, there's um, some nice little PDFs on uh, nutrition. That is one place you can look. The American Diabetes website, uh, diabetes.org, they have, if you look on the left-hand column, there is a nutrition section and the Diabetes Food Hub is a great place to look for recipes. There's also on that same page is some links for like the diabetes forecast and diabetes self-management. Um, these are magazines, but you don't have to get the magazines to, you can access them through the ADA website and there's good recipes on these two as well. I will say the magazines are pretty uh, inexpensive and um, they have a lot of good tips in them. Sometimes they send me a promotional version and I will say I enjoy reading them. They're pretty light reading and they have a lot of good recipes and just tips in general. So you can check them out on the um, ADA website and I think it's only sometimes like a dollar an issue to subscribe. The uh, ADA also has a um, free like brochure you can order from their website. It's where do I begin living with type two diabetes. They have a beautiful my plate planner section in there, and um, I think they send you some other you know promotional information. If you are looking for a low carb diet, the Diet Doctor is a good site. They have a lot of good recipes for a lower carb meal plan. And then, of course, if you're looking for more information on the plate, it is uh, choosemyplate.gov has a lot of, again, good recipes and resources for meal planning. And then just some apps. There's lots of apps. These are just a few. Again, I usually encourage my patients to download Calorie King. 
a lot of patients like my fitness pal to track um, uh, calories. Uh, Figwe is one um, app that is a visual. So it sort of shows you what is a small, medium, large portion of food. So if you're a visual person, the Figwe app is a good app. There is also some other apps that help for um, blood sugar meal planning and um, you know insulin um, administration. So there's some other apps for that. Fujicate is another one, and this is one that you can. I think my fitness pal as well. You can actually scan a barcode for nutrition information. So. Um, Fujicate, what they do is you scan the product and then it sort of gives it a grade and it says, you know, like say, A, this is a great product or like maybe D, not such a great choice. So that's kind of interesting too. So those are just some good apps. I suggest people just download a bunch of apps and see which ones you like. Most of them are free. Some of them, if you pay a little more, you get a, a, a little a little more from it, but most of the free stuff is fine. And then keep the ones you like. So with that, thank you for attending this program. And um, if you have any further questions, now's the time. All right, awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we have a couple of questions actually. Oh, okay. One is how, uh, how do you feel about cooking with coconut oil versus olive oil? Yeah, coconut oil probably is a little bit more in saturated fat. So probably olive oil would be a better choice. Yeah, and we, uh, we also have a question about if this will be available for viewing later and I'll, I'll let you know, yes, it will. Um, this will be on the Ripen YouTube channel and I will type the link into the chat so you can see it in just a second. But then one other question we have for Lisa um, what do you think of the keto diet for diabetics? Right. So the low carb diet is definitely now um, um, recognized and in, in for people with diabetes. I'm not sure it's is going into ketosis is probably, I suggest to patients that following a low carb diet can be very, very beneficial and can help with weight management as well as blood sugar control. So I think there's a little bit of a difference. So I do think that you can have, eat, have a healthy meal plan and, uh, you know, reduce your carbs. I do think it's a good idea to kind of introduce them back because carbohydrate foods provide a lot of good nutrition. So I don't want people to, um, to completely cut out say fruits or you know whole grains because they do provide a lot of um, benefits but we just want to try to minimize them and make healthy choices so I do agree that a very low carb diet can be of a, a benefit for uh, weight management and diabetes. Awesome interesting well Lisa I want to thank you that was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Lots of good information uh, and I want to thank our audience for joining us today. As I said, we will be doing this every Friday uh, at noon. We'll have a different health wellness expert uh, presenting every week. We're going to be doing this up until World Diabetes Day on Saturday, November 14th. And you can learn more about Rhode Island World Diabetes Day and the Road to Wellness 2020 program at riwdd.org. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.